If you want to know more about a realm where the boundaries of sadistic pleasure are pushed to their darkest limits, today we dive into the spine-chilling tale that exposes the twisted secrets of an elite society. Picture an exclusive club of affluent thrill-seekers who will luxuriate in the macabre, a clandestine group willing to part with their fortunes for a taste of unspeakable power. Brace yourselves for in this horrifying narrative, innocence is shattered, lives are discarded, and the malevolent reign supreme. Join me as we unravel the sinister lore of a torture society that indulges in the unholy pleasures of torment and murder. Paxton Rodriguez and Josh Brooks are two college students traveling across Europe with their Icelandic friend Oli, who they just met. After visiting an Amsterdam nightclub followed by a brothel, they are unable to get back into their hostel because of a curfew. After waking up a few people trying to get back in, they accept an offer from a man named Alexi to stay at his apartment, the same guy we see walk into the hostel at the beginning of the movie. He convinces them that instead of going to Barcelona, they should visit a hostel in Slovakia with beautiful women that will fulfill their every sexual desire. Uh, why is it always our dicks that get us in trouble? The three board a train to Slovakia where they encounter a Dutch businessman who touches Josh's leg. Josh yells at him, causing him to leave. Shortly after, they arrive at the train station, which apparently is in the middle of nowhere. But once they check into the hostel, they find out that their roommates are two women, Natalia and Svetlana. The women invite them to a spa where for a second heaven does seem real, but remember the old saying, whenever something is too good to be true, it probably is. Later that night, they go to a disco when Josh goes outside and runs in with a gang of local criminal gypsy kids. Now just to be clear, these kids are not associated with the elite hunting club. They just rob people who trespass on their turfs who refuse to give them bubblegum or money. Anyways, the Dutch businessman from earlier intervenes to defend him. Josh apologizes for his reaction on the train and offers him to buy a drink, where they seemingly become cool with each other again. And this is when we catch a glimpse of the tattoo on the businessman's arm. It is a bloodhound which is also the logo of the elite hunting club. Every client must have this tattoo in order to show that they're part of the club. Let me show you something, this is pretty sweet. Check this out. What do you think of this? Come on, let me see yours. Come on, let me see yours, we're all in the same club. What? I'll be on a second, guy. After that, Paxton and Josh have sex with Natalia and Svetlana, while Oli leaves with the desk girl Vala. The next morning, Oli doesn't return. The two are approached by a Japanese woman named Kana, who shows them a photo of Oli and her friend Yuki, who is also missing. After that, Paxton tells Josh about the time he saw a little girl drowning when he was eight years old. Dude, did I ever tell you that I saw a girl drown when I was in? A little girl, probably four or five. And I yelled, you know, there's this girl drowning. And uh, she couldn't see her from the tower and probably thought I was making it up. The kid was dead. Jesus. Yeah, I had nightmares for years after that. I just felt like I could have done more to save that girl. He tells him that he had nightmares for years after that, feeling guilty that he didn't do more to save her life. This is relevant because later on in the film when Paxton is making his escape, he stops when he hears Kana's screams of pain in the background. And instead of leaving her, he goes back and saves her life. And this is most likely due to that event in his past. When he heard the screams of the little girl drowning, but he didn't do more to save her, this is the same situation in the sense that he's hearing those screams, and if he does nothing to save her, he would have to live with that guilt for the rest of his life. So in a way, we get a mini character arc for Paxton, I guess. But what's ironic is in this scene, he says that he made eye contact with the little girl, which was weird. We made eye contact, which was a weird thing. And in the scene when he goes back to save Kana, it's her eyes that are getting blowtorched. So I don't know if there's a deeper meaning there, but it's just kind of ironic. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Oli has been decapitated while Yuki is being tortured. Josh is anxious to leave, but Paxton convinces him to stay one more night with Natalia and Svetlana, who both slip the men tranquilizers that night. Josh faints on his bed, while the ill Paxton ends up locked in the pantry. Josh wakes up in a dungeon-like room, where the Dutch businessman begins maiming him with a drill, making holes in Josh's body. Josh screams in agony and asks him why he's doing all of this, which the businessman replies that he always wanted to become a surgeon, but the board would always overlook him because of his shaking hands. I've always wanted to be a surgeon, but the boards would not pass me. Can you be smiling? He then continues to slice his Achilles tendon and then slits his throat. Paxton wakes up in the disco and returns to the hostel, where he learns that he had supposedly checked out. He is then greeted by two women who invite him to the spa. 
This gives us a hint to how big the operation really is, since they can seemingly swap out beautiful women the next day. I'm guessing that they have about 15 to 20 beautiful women that are employees. And when I say beautiful women employees, I really mean demon hookers. I mean, these girls are just luring these poor men into their untimely demise. Suspicious, he locates Natalia and Svetlana to ask them to help him find his friend. Natalia takes Paxton to an old factory where he sees Josh's mutilated corpse being stitched together by the Dutch businessman. Two men then seize Paxton and drag him down a hallway, passing by several rooms where other people are being tortured. Paxton is then restrained and prepped to be tortured by a German client named Johan. While cutting off a few of Paxton's fingers with a chainsaw, Johan unintentionally severs his hand restraints. Johan falls over, accidentally severing his own leg with the chainsaw. Paxton shoots Johan in the head with a gun and then kills a guard, which allows him to get into Johan's surgeon outfit so that he can sneak out unnoticed. As he finds himself in the locker room, he then changes into business clothes and finds a business card for the Elite Hunting Club. This is the first revelation the audience gets as to what the hell is going on. The Elite Hunting Club is an organization that allows its clientele to pay, to kill, and mutilate tourists. The back of the card shows us the price for each tier, starting with $5,000 for a resident, $10,000 for a European, and the epic twenty-five dollars for an American, because apparently Americans are the most valuable to torture. When Paxton looks outside the window, we can also see the club members talking to the police, which we can assume is them bribing the police to overlook tourist disappearances. When Paxton is making his escape, he stops when he hears Kana's screams of pain in the background, and instead of leaving her, he goes back and shoots the man and rescues Kana, and they flee in a stolen car pursued by guards. As they're fleeing in the town, Paxton runs into Natalia and Svetlana and Alexei, realizing in that moment that the club pays representatives like Alexei to lure prospects into the hostel and use other representatives like the beautiful women to tranquilize their victims. With this devastating realization, Paxton runs over Natalia and Svetlana and Alexei, killing two of them while the pursuing car finishes off the third. He also encounters the gypsy delinquents from earlier and gives them a big pack of candy and gum. They then attack and kill the men pursuing Paxton with concrete blocks. I mean, even the f kids are savages in this place. The two make it to the train station, where Kana sees her disfigured face for the first time. Unable to come to terms with the horror that she sees, she ends up killing herself by leaping in front of an oncoming train, which attracts attention and allows Paxton to board another train unnoticed. Aboard, Paxton hears the voice of the Dutch businessman, and when the train stops in Vienna, Paxton follows the Dutch businessman into a restroom and kills him in revenge for his friend's deaths and suffering he caused him before boarding another train. And part of what makes this ending so scary is that there's no resolution to the conflict. Since there's no face to this organization or some sort of secret leader, there's no headmaster where you can point your finger and say, kill him, and all of this stops. It's not like it's a cult with one clear motive or intention, it is literally a club with various types of clients that have different reasons for what they're doing, such as the businessman who just wanted to be a surgeon, or the businessman that wanted a new thrill in life. Everybody is different, making the horror feel unconnected and palpable. It has to be a big business with a lot of clients in order to cover all the costs needed in order to keep this thing running. Just think about it. They probably have 15 to 20 demon hookers working for them. On top of that, they must at least have 20 to 30 guards in order to protect this place, plus a few other representatives, and this is the money that they're making. I'm thinking that the guards are on a payroll and that the girl slash guys that lure the victims in get a cut of the sale. The reason why I think this is because in this scene, she mentions how she got a lot of money for him, leading me to believe they're not just on a payroll, but they actually get a cut of the sale. And since he's American, $25,000 is a lot of money, so it makes sense if you had a 10% cut, you'd make more money with the 25 grand. The operation is perfectly set up to feel as though it is impossible for these young, naive tourists to beat it leaving you with this nihilistic void of defeat. But in the end, the irony comes down to the mentality of the two groups of people. The tourists have been all over the world seeing everything it has to offer and want something new to experience. Same with these rich people who have all the money in the world and have experienced everything life has to offer in that sense and want the rush of something new. So that's it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed the sinister lore of Hostel, the first movie. If you guys enjoyed it, comment down below if you wanna see part two and Hostel 3, and subscribe if you guys are not already, and I will catch you guys on the next one. Peace.